So this week we're slated to do sections 5.1, 5.2, and 5.3. We'll do as much of 5. Point, uh, all of 5.1 and as much of 5.2 as we can stand or fit uh, today, and then we'll finish up 5.2 and do all of 5.3. We're going to look at a totally new problem in calculus, not new to the universe, but new to us. Uh, we've been focusing a lot on the question of finding the slope of the line tangent to a curve. And now we're going to change focus and look instead on the idea of finding areas of regions. Uh, analogous to that computation, it turns out, is finding the distance something travels uh, from its velocity. Okay? That will bring us to uh, a new uh, object to study in calculus called the definite integral. So we'll look at the definition of the definite integral and some elementary properties of that thing. Okay. So first I want to tell you a story. We'll talk about this idea of area as it moves throughout uh, the, the century. Okay. We think of area as pretty much a decided thing, but as it turns out, uh, area was studied for thousands of years before we got it in the form that we know right now. So from the very beginning, uh, we say that we know that the area of a rectangle is the product of its length and its width. And we define the area of a rectangle to be that product. Now you might think, well, of course, the area of a rectangle is the length times the width. But actually, area is not something that uh, is inherent to the polygon itself. It's basically a measure that we've constructed to uh, you know, decide how to distinguish between various polygons. OK, so let's assume that we all agree that the area of a rectangle is its length times its width. Now, area, we would like it to have certain properties. For instance, if I take something and cut it up into pieces, and I can find the area of the pieces, then I should be able to find the area of the whole thing by adding up the areas of the pieces. So area should have some kind of additivity property to it. And if we agree on that, then we can do things like find areas of parallelograms. How would we do that? Well, notice if you take this parallelogram and cut off the triangle at the end, then you can glue that triangle onto the other end, and what we have is a rectangle. Okay? And we haven't changed the area because we cut off one piece and we moved it over to the other side. So the area of the parallelogram should be equal to the area of the trapezoid plus the area of the triangle. But if we put the triangle on the other side of the trapezoid, we see we have a rectangle. So the area of the parallelogram is the area of this rectangle. And what's the area of the rectangle? Well, it's got a base and it's got a height, and so its area is the product of the base and the height. OK, so you s we started from the idea of uh, area of a rectangle. And from that, we moved to the parallelogram. Triangles are almost as easy, because if I take this triangle here and uh, copy and paste it with a rotation, so do a little control C, control V, and rotate it, then what I have is a parallelogram. Think about that. Take your triangle, copy and paste it, rotate it 180 degrees, stick them back together, we have a parallelogram. And I, because I know the area of the parallelogram, the area of the triangle must be half as much. right? So the area of the parallelogram is base times height, which means the area of the triangle is 1 half base times height. This is where that formula comes from. OK, now, once you've got triangles, actually you're in really good shape because any polygon can be triangulated. That means you can draw, uh, decompose it into a union of triangles. And since we can find the areas of all the triangles, then we can find the area of the polygon simply by adding it up. So whether your polygon is a nice uh, regular polygon like this uh, pentagon here, you can decompose it into the Freitas symbol, uh, just find the area of one of these triangles out all together, or some strange concave looking polygon, you can still break it up into So as far as areas of polygons, we are all set, because this pretty much ends the story. We can be triangulated. But what this doesn't help us find is areas of, say, that ellipse that I've drawn on the left, or this, this uh, kidney bean here that I drew on the right. Um, because we don't have a way to triangulate the kidney bean or the oval in a way that we can convert it into a bunch of triangles. Okay, there's always going to be some curved part here, which won't be decomposable into triangles. So what do we do there? And that pretty much ended the story for Euclid and his ilk. Okay? However, if you move forward just a couple of hundred years, 
you get to Archimedes, and Archimedes had some insights which allowed um, mathematicians of the time to find some areas of some curved regions. Archimedes is a great character in the history of mathematics. He was a geometer uh, for the city of Syracuse, and he was also the resident weapons engineer. Here's an invention of Archimedes. It's called the Archimedean screw. And what it is, if you can see this, it's basically a cylinder with some kind of helix thing inside the cylinder. And this is a body of water. The idea is to move the water up here, right? Pump the water out of the river. If you turn the screw this way, then the water basically passes through um, one level up to the next and just marches its way up to the top and then pours out. How many of you have been to the Liberty Science Center over in Jersey City? If you go into that kids area, and oh, this is where I go when I go to the Liberty Science Center, uh, they have in their ball pit one of these things that if you turn the handle and the balls just sort of march up the little conveyor belt. Thing. And that's the Archimedean screw, thousands of year old uh, technology and still used in Africa to irrigate uh, fields. Now, Archimedes is also known for this invention here, uh, which is called the Archimedean death ray. Sounds exciting, right? So Syracuse was under siege by, I think, the Persians. And uh, Syracuse is on the water. And here come the Persian boats. And Archimedes' idea was to have all of the soldiers stand uh, at, the, you know, at the edge of the wall there and focus their shields at a single point. So if you've ever done this with ants and a magnifying glass, you know what's going to happen. Right? The beams of the sun get focused into a single point, and it burned up the sails of the boats, at which point they could be promptly sunk. So sounds like a fun story, right? Did it really happen? It seems far-fetched. And in fact, it was the subject of one of the episodes of the TV show Mythbusters. Uh, they decided that it could not happen. And then a group of students at MIT were able to recre uh, recreate the whole thing, except they used like really high precision mirrors. And everything had to stand perfectly still. And they got it to work then. But it seems like it was probably just an idea of Archimedes. Okay, But what did that have to do with area? Archimedes was able to find the area of uh, this region here, which is basically a parabola cut off at the edge, so the point or the rounded end of a parabola. And here's how he did it. Well, as it turns out, you can inscribe a triangle inside the parabola. This is basically your standard y equals x squared parabola. And Archimedes discovered that if you inscribe smaller triangles inside that leftover piece, then the area of the smaller triangles is 1 8 the area of the larger triangle. And so the area of the pieces which are inside the yellow right now is the original one for the big triangle and two copies of an eighth for the two small triangles. Now that's not the entire area of this whole parabola region because you can see there's still some overlap between the two. So Archimedes said, no problem. I can get slivers inside those little bits there. Four more triangles. And by the same theorem that he had proven, the area of the smaller triangles was each an eighth of the area of the next biggest triangle. So each of those has area 1 64th. Now, has, has he completely in, uh, gotten the entire curved region? No. You can still see there's some white bits there. Uh, but he can do this process again, right? He can continue to inscribe little triangle pieces inside the parabola region that's left over. And what he gets is a series that looks like this. The first triangle has area 1. The next step involves two triangles of area 1 8. The next step involves four triangles of area 1 64th. How many triangles are in the next step that I'm not writing here? How many triangles? Eight, because it doubles every time, right? And how big is the area of those triangles going to be? Well, if you look at the area, we go from 1 to 1 8th to 1 64th. You don't have to say it in simplest terms, but what, uh, what are we going to multiply out here? 1 over 512, and 512 is 8 cubed, right? OK, so it's 1 uh, 1 8th, 1 8th squared, 1 8th cubed. And the next term is going to be 1 8th to the 4th, 1 8th to the 5th. So in each step, we'll have, um, let's see, 2 to the n triangles, and they'll have area 1 8th to the n. And so the pieces that we're summing up look like 1 4th to the n. This is 1 1 4th squared, sorry, 1 
1 fourth, 1 fourth squared. The next term will be 1 fourth cubed, 1 fourth to the fourth, 1 fourth to the fifth. All of the terms will look like powers of 1 fourth. We want to add up all of those. Can we do that? Can we add up infinitely many positive numbers and still get a positive number? Can we add up 1 plus a fourth plus a sixteenth plus the uh, uh, 1 256? No, 1 64th is the next one. Then 1 over 256, and so on. Well, as it turns out, there's a nice little bit of algebra to find the sum of a geometric series. Uh, it comes from this bit of factorization. If I take 1 minus r times 1 plus r plus r squared plus r cubed, etc., up to r to the n, then what I get is 1 minus r to the n plus 1. Holy cow, where did that come from? Basically, it's just a foil. Because if you take 1 minus r times the sum of all the powers of r, then the first thing you do is take 1 times the sum of all these powers, which just means write it down again. And then you take r times that same sum of powers. Okay, and taking r times the sum of powers is like taking r times 1, and r times r, and r times r squared. In other words, r plus r squared plus r cubed, etc., up to, and then we get one more power of r. So what happens when you take 1 plus r plus r squared, etc., up to r to the n, and subtract r plus r squared plus r cubed, etc., up to r to the n plus 1? Well, the 1 here stays. But the r here cancels with this r, and the r squared cancels with this r squared. The next term, which you don't see here, is r cubed, is going to cancel with this one, etc. Up to the r to the n, that cancels with this r to the n. This r to the n plus 1 doesn't cancel. So everything cancels except the first r and the last r to the n plus 1. OK, who cares? Well, it means that we can take the uh, sum of the powers of r, 1 plus r plus r squared plus r cubed, up to r to the n, and write it as 1 minus r to the n plus 1 divided by 1 minus r. I just took this line, divided through by 1 minus r. Okay, So that's helpful for us, because what we want to do is look at what happens when r is 1 fourth. Now if r is 1 fourth, then I have 1 minus 1 fourth. That's fine. And 1 minus 1 fourth to a large power. So summing up all these powers of r, becomes 1 minus 1 fourth to the n plus 1 divided by 1 minus 1 fourth. Now what happens to 1 fourth to the n plus 1 as n gets larger and larger and larger? What happens to 1? It gets smaller and smaller, right? We're taking sm uh, larger and larger powers of a number which is smaller, OK? So that numerator is going to go to just 1. The denominator doesn't depend on n. It's just the constant 3 fourths. And so in the limit, this sequence of partial sums of the powers of 1 fourth tends to 4 thirds. Okay? So Archimedes used this to show that the area of that region inside the parabola was equal to 4 thirds. Okay? This is good news for Archimedes and his friends, because they were Pythagoreans, and they believed that rational numbers were superior to irrational numbers. They were really dismayed that the area of a circle was not a rational number, but they, were, you know, they got some satisfaction out of the fact that the area of a parabola was a rational number. Okay. So Archimedes and uh, the people who were doing the same kind of thing called this method the method of exhaustion. And not because we're tired after looking at it, but that we were able to basically account for all of the leftover area if we would simply take enough steps in the iteration. Okay. So that, that's uh, Archimedes' contribution to the study of area. Uh, the end of Archimedes came when the Persians finally did overrun the city. Um, Archimedes was sitting on the beach doing his math. You know, back in that day, they didn't even have chalkboards, let alone fancy PowerPoint presentations. Uh, so he was scribbling in the sand, doing a little math. And the soldier came up to him and said, what are you doing? And he said, hey, you're, you're standing in my drawing. And the soldier killed him. That was the end of one of the great minds in Greek math. Not before he found, solved this problem, though. OK, so let's fast forward a couple, let's see, about 1,500 years now. And let's look at Cavalieri. Cavalieri is an Italian mathematician, uh, basically Renaissance era. And he looked at this area problem from a different perspective. You see, in between Archimedes and Cavalieri, you have Descartes. And Descartes' contribution to geometry was to think about the, you know, the coordinate axes. Right? And after Descartes, we can say, all right, the parabola is the graph of y equals x squared. Archimedes didn't know what a graph was, but Cavalieri did. 
Okay, so Archimedes wanted to find the area inside this parabola region. Cavalieri, because he understood the coordinate axes, instead wanted to find the area under the curve here. Okay, and rather than using triangles, uh, Cavalieri decided to use rectangles. And he said, well, I can draw a rectangle inside that region that I want to find the area of. And the area of this rectangle is one half times one fourth. And why is it one fourth? Well, this is the graph of y equals x squared. So if this is x coordinate one half, the y coordinate is one fourth. So one half times one fourth is one eighth. Now, obviously, that's not the area of the curved region because I've got a bunch of left over here and here. All right. But Cavalieri said I could instead take two rectangles by breaking up the interval into three pieces. And if he did that, then we would have one rectangle with width one third and one rectangle with width one third. The height of the first rectangle is one third squared, or one ninth. The height of the second rectangle is two thirds squared, or four ninths. So add up all those fractions, what do you get? We have one third times one ninth plus one third times four ninths. That is five twenty sevenths. And one third times one ninth is one twenty seventh. One third times four ninths is four twenty sevenths. This they sum up to five twenty sevenths. Okay, now do we have the entire curved region? Obviously not. There's still some overlap. To get a little bit better, Cavalieri said I can divide the interval up into four pieces. Okay, and take three rectangles. Each of those rectangles has what for a width? One fourth, because we go from one fourth to two fourths, and from two fourths to three fourths, and from three fourths to four fourths. And what are the heights of these rectangles? Well, we are taking heights from the graph of the function. So this is x coordinate one fourth which means that its height is 1 fourth squared. This is x coordinate 1 half, or 2 fourths. So its height is 2 fourths squared. This is the x coordinate 3 fourths. So its height is 3 fourths squared. So it's 1 16th times a fourth plus um, 4 sixteenths, or 1 fourth times a fourth, plus 9 sixteenths times a fourth. And if you add up all of those, what you get is 14 64. So are you with me? What's his next step? Well, he said, no problem. Four was not a big deal. Let me do five now. So divide up the interval zero to one into five pieces. Each one is one-fifth wide. So each rectangle here, we've got four of them, will have a width of one-fifth. And what are the heights going to be now? What's the height of the first rectangle? One-twenty-fifth. And the height of the second rectangle? 4 25ths, because it's 2 fifths squared. 9 25ths. 16 25ths. And then we're done, right? So if we add up 1 1 20, this is 1 fifth times 1 25th, right? So 1 1 25th plus 4 1 25th plus 9 1 25th plus 16 1 25th uh, equals 30 1 25ths. OK, now is there a pattern emerging in these numbers that we've seen so far? Any, any pattern you can recognize uh, between L2, L3, L4, and L5 that could be continued in general? If I were to tell you a certain number of rectangles, could you come up with this fraction here? Yeah? That's right. That's right. The denominator is the cube of the number of rectangles, right? L5 has a denominator of 125. L4 has a denominator of 64. L3 has a denominator of 27. L2 has a denominator of 8. And those are all the cubes of the number of rectangles. And as far as the numerator goes, we're adding up the perfect squares up until, well, let's see. At stage 5, we're adding up the four first squares. At stage 4, we're adding up the three first squares. And so that's the, uh, that's the way we get. So if we wanted, say, you know, 20 rectangles here, then the denominator would be 20 cubed, and the numerator would be 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared, dot, 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 et cetera, up to 19 squared. Okay. Now, to find what that would be tending to, uh, we would have to find that number somewhat more precisely. 
Okay? But the general process for this particular area computation is to divide up the interval into n pieces. Each one of those pieces will have width 1 over n. Okay? And then the area of uh, one of the rectangles will be 1 over n. times uh, some number over n squared, right? Whether it's 1 over n squared, 2 over n squared, what's up? Oh, OK. 3 over n squared, 4 over n squared, et cetera, up to n minus 1 over n squared, OK? And if you multiply it together, what you get is sum squared divided by n cubed. And the whole area you get is 1 over n cubed plus 2 over n cubed, et cetera, up to n minus 1 over n cubed. OK, well, that's, that's not so bad. But what I want to do is find out what this tends to as n gets larger and larger. And the dot, dot, dot thing is kind of standing in the way. Well, luckily for Cavalieri, he had read up on his predecessors. And he knew about this fact, that if you sum up the squares, 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared, et cetera, up to n minus 1 squared, then what you get is n times n minus 1 times 2n minus 1 over 6. So this was a formula that the Arabs knew. You know, the Arabs invented algebra. And uh, Fibonacci uh, rediscovered or learned from the Arabs a lot of what they had discovered. And he wrote it down in his book, Liber Abaci, where he also wrote about the bunnies and the, the whole Fibonacci sequence thing. OK, but this is one of those things in that book. And so Cavalieri said, no problem. I now know that this uh, numerator here looks like n times n minus 1 times 2n minus 1 over 6. The denominator n cubed stays. And so ln, the amount of area I get after dividing the interval up into n pieces, is this fraction. Okay. Now that looks pretty messy. But if you plug in the n's that we had already computed, like n equals 2, n equals 4, n equals 5, you will get the numbers that we got already. But the real question is, you know, what if we take this to exhaustive levels, where we take larger and larger amounts of rectangles, what does this sum tend to? Okay. Well, this is just a, a rational fraction, right? a rational function in the variable n. And we know from our basic study about limits at infinity that when you have a rational function, you can just look at the degree of the numerator and the degree of the denominator to help decide what the limit is going to be. And what is the degree of the numerator? 3, right? This is degree 1, degree 1, degree 1. So degree 3 in the numerator, degree 3 in the denominator. And so this is the situation where you can have a finite non-zero limit. What is that limit? Well, you need to look at the ratio of the coefficients of the n cubed term in the numerator and denominator. And what's the coefficient of n cubed in this numerator? 2, right? Because it's n times n times 2n. 2n cubed divided by 6n cubed. So the ratio goes to one, uh, 2 6 or 1 third. OK, well, deep breath. What did we discover? Well, this a similar technique to uh, Archimedes in that we're able to find the area of this particular curved region. And we got 1 third. Back up to the picture here. Archimedes found a different area. He found the area of this half of the parabola and then the other side, right, the mirror image. And he got that was 4 thirds. OK, so this, according to Archimedes, should have area 2 thirds. And Cavalieri said this has area 1 third. Two of those together add up to one, which would be the area of the unit square. So they are consistent there. Okay. So good news. Uh, what are the advantages of Cavalieri's method over Archimedes' method? Well, Archimedes was uh, a little bit ad hoc, and it was based on this very particular geometric fact about triangles inscribed in parabolas. What's nice about Cavalieri's method is that you can do the same deal with a different function, and formally you've got pretty much the same construction. So instead of looking at the area under the squaring function, y equals x squared, what happens if you instead look at the area under the cubing function, y equals x cubed? Well, pretty much uh, the form of the sum goes over the same. Again, you divide up the interval 0 to 1 into n pieces. Again, each of them will have width 1 over n. But what's different, that instead of plugging those multiples of 1 over n into the squaring function, now we're plugging them into the cubing function. So ln would be 1 over n times 1 over n quantity cubed plus 2 over n quantity cubed 
plus 3 over n quantity cubed, all the way up to n minus 1 over n quantity cubed. Okay. When we do that, what we see is we have a, a different uh, sum. Instead of a sum of squares divided by a cube, we have a sum of cubes divided by a fourth. And that makes sense because we have n times n cubed in each of these denominators. And we have cubes in each of the numerators. Uh, and again, we're in this situation where we need a, a, a formula to figure out how to sum this thing. Okay. Well, there's another theorem like that. Uh, it's discovered by several people, including Nicomachus, who was a, I guess he was Babylonian uh, in the first century as the common era. Arabiata is an Indian, and Al Karaji was an Arab. And they all discovered this basic uh, fact about sums of cubes. You can get the sum of the first n minus 1 cubes by taking 1 half times n times n minus 1 quantity squared. Good news for us, we can plug that back in there. This is n squared n times n minus 1 quantity squared divided by 2 squared. OK. And that is the thing that we would like to find the limit of as n gets larger and larger. What's the degree of the numerator? 4, right? Because it's a square times a square, so it's fourth power. And the coefficient of n to the fourth in the numerator is just 1. The denominator is also fourth degree. Its coefficient is 4. And so the ratio is, tends to 1 fourth as n goes to infinity. Okay, so Cavalieri's method is showing some strength because it, it can be used for other kinds of functions. Now, one argument you might make against Cavalieri's method is that it was sort of biased to pick these uh, rectangles that were underneath the curve by taking the left-hand endpoint and plugging into the function. What if instead you plugged in the right-hand endpoint to the function, took that to be the height of the rectangle? Obviously, you get something which is a little bit more than the area under the curve. But what's interesting is that you don't get a different answer in the limit. Because if you do the construction, instead of summing up the first n minus 1 cubes, you end up summing up the first n cubes. Okay, it's a slightly different formula here, but it's still a fourth degree polynomial with leading coefficient 1. And the denominator is still going to be 4 into the fourth, and so the limit still ends up being 1 fourth. Okay, so whether you choose left-hand endpoints and underlapping area, or right-hand endpoints and overlapping area, in the limit we get the same amount of area. And this is, uh, Cavalieri discovered that as well. Okay. So how does this technique work in general? Well, basically we start with the idea of some function defined on an interval a to b. And for now we'll assume that it's a non-negative function. Okay, and the problem is to find the area, as we say now, under the curve. To be technical, what we mean is the area of the region which is between x equals a, x equals b, the, the x-axis, and the curve, y equals f of x. And the technique we'll use is basically going to be a limiting process. Pick a large number n, and for the purposes of our drawing, large looks like it's about 7. Okay, divide up the interval a to b into n pieces. If all those pieces have the same width, then the width between them is just the width of the interval divided by the number of pieces. Once we do that, we, then we just mark off pieces that wide from the beginning to the end. So x0 will be another word for a. x1 will be delta x plus a. x2 will be 2 times delta x plus a. And x3 will be 3 times delta x plus b all the, plus a all the way down. So if you want to be super symbolic about it, each uh, tick mark here, x sub i, is the initial one, a, plus i times the width of each one, that is i times delta x. All that goes up to the last one, x sub n, which is a plus n times delta x. But since delta x is the difference between them over n, a plus n delta x just gets you to b. Okay. So this is the symbolature behind the process of taking the interval between a and b, dividing it up into n pieces, and giving names to all those pieces. Okay. Now what we'll do is use those intervals that we divide up the whole interval into as a, a base for a rectangle. Now what's the height of that rectangle? The height of that rectangle is going to come from the graph of the function. 
So we pick a point in each interval, and we plug that point into the function, and that function value gives us a height of a rectangle. And we'll do this all the way down the interval, and then add up the areas of all those rectangles. So pick a point C1 in the first interval. F of C1 times delta x will be the area of the first rectangle. Pick a point C2 in the second interval. F of C2 times delta x will be the area of the second rectangle. And then all the way down to the end, add them all up. Okay, a nice way to write that is to use this, what we call summation notation. Basically, what you see here is an abbreviation for what you see here without the dot, dot, dots. So what this says is, let i be every number between 1 and n. Write down f of c sub that number times delta x and add them all together. Okay, sigma notation is not, uh, is not equal to math. It's just a different kind of notation. So we can approximate the area under the curve by adding up areas of rectangles. Okay. Now, how we decide what uh, ci's or what uh, points to plug in is a matter of choice. The first choice um, that we had done before was to simply take the left-hand endpoint of every interval and plug it in. So plug in this, use that as the height of the first rectangle. Plug in this point, use that as the height of the second rectangle. Plug in this point, use that as the height of the third rectangle, and so on all the way down. But why be biased towards the left hand? Yes, I'm left-handed, but that doesn't mean you have to be left-handed. You can go on the right-hand side as well. Take the right-hand endpoint, plug it in, and use that to compute the height of each rectangle. See how the rectangle has the height equal to the function value at the right-hand endpoint, and then all the way up there. Okay, But you know, maybe you don't want to go to either extreme. You can take the midpoint of each interval. The midpoint between the first two endpoints, and plug it in, that would be the height of the first rectangle. Midpoint, plug it in, height of the second rectangle. Midpoint, plug it in, height of the third rectangle. Midpoint, plug it in, and so on. Okay. So R sub n for right-hand endpoints, M sub n for midpoints. Okay. Take a look at the amount of error that we get when we plug in left-hand endpoints, right-hand endpoints, and midpoints. What do you see in particular about, just on this first interval, the difference between left, right, and middle? Just looking at the first one. Left, right, middle. Left, right, middle. OK. Is any of these bigger than the area under the curve? Right's bigger, left smaller, and what about middle? Just about right? It's hard to tell, but what we do see is that there's some overlap here and some underlap here, and so we get a little bit of cancellation. We get some errors going in the opposite direction here, and so it looks like this is going to be a little bit closer to the actual area. And the same thing happens on each piece. Here we got underlap and overlap, underlap and overlap, overlap and underlap. So for this reason, the midpoint rule is often used uh, for estimation because it's, it gets, it's a, a better approximation than, say, right-hand endpoints or left-hand endpoints. OK, but you can do other things. You can take the maximum. Actually, this looks like the minimum. Yeah, I've got these mixed up. Ha -ha. Uh, so if you can take the maximum function value on each subinterval. Or you can take the minimum function value on each subinterval. This is minimum. This is maximum. If you take minimums, then you are guaranteed to get an area less than the area under the curve. If you take maxima, then you're guaranteed to get an area greater than the area under the curve. OK, you can even do something strange like pick a random point in each subinterval and use that to find your heights of rectangles. OK, so lots of different ways to find these sample points. And the general uh, concept is the idea of a Riemann sum. So L sub n, R sub n, M sub n, U sub n, L sub n, these are all different kinds of Riemann sums. OK. Now, that all seems like an overwhelming amount of choices. But the beautiful fact is that for certain nice functions, continuous is nice enough, the choices that we make 
go away in the limit. Whether we take left-hand endpoints for our sample points, or right-hand endpoints, or midpoints, or maxima, or minima, or random points, uh, in the limit, all of those Riemann sums are going to converge to the same thing. All right, let me, I have a demonstration here. If I'm taking left-hand endpoints and one interval, then as it turns out for this particular function, the sum I get is three. If I take two, en two uh, intervals, I get 5.25. Three intervals, 6.0, 6.375, 6.85, 6 6.93, seven something, seven, okay. How many of these do I have? I think I got 30. All right, so 30 intervals using left-hand endpoints, I get a sum around 7.348 something something. Okay. With right-hand endpoints, this is obviously too big, right? One interval is 12, two intervals 9.75, three intervals 8, 9 something, 8.625, da 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 okay. L R sub 15, 7.79, R sub 20, 7.72, R30, 7.64. Okay, so L30 was about 7.38. R30, 7.64. Midpoints, we would hope to be something in between those. Okay, midpoint with 15 intervals, 7.49. Midpoint with 20 intervals, 7.4994. And with 30 intervals, what do we get? 7.498. And that is in between. If we took more than 30, we would get something even closer. All right, using maxima, what do we get here? 10 intervals, 8.27. 20 intervals, 7.88. 30 intervals, 7.75. And that's bigger than the area under the curve. Using minima, 15, 6.98. And 37.24. Okay, so what are these all tending to? What do you think if you had to make a guess at the area, actual area under the curve? Yeah, something like 7.5. Okay. So I, I don't have one with random points, but you, you get the picture, right? So no matter whether you're taking left hand endpoints, right hand endpoints, midpoints, upper sums, lower sums, random points, whatever. Uh, all of these Riemann sums are going to converge to the same thing. And so this method of computing area is independent of the choices you make. Okay, so I'm gonna compare what we've just been doing with what we had been doing in the previous you know, three chapters. So in the previous three chapters, basically we're talking about what's called the tangent problem. And in chapter five, we're going to talk about the area problem. In the tangent problem, we have a curve and we would like to find the slope of that curve. Now, in the area problem, we have a curved region, and we want to find the area of that curved region. Okay? The problem with the tangent problem is that we cannot compute the slope of a single point on a curve, because we really only know how to find the slope of a line. Same thing for the area problem. We don't really know how to find the area of something curved. We know how to find the area of polygons. What we do in the tangent problem is that we approximate that curve with a line. We say, OK, take the tangent line to the curve at that point and try to measure that slope. Same thing with the area problem. We approximate the region that we want to find the area of with a bunch of polygons and find the areas of those polygons, add them all up together. In each case, what you do is take better and better approximations. You approximate the curve with a secant line and find the slope of the secant line, then take the limit over all the secants or with the area, approximate the curved region with a bunch of polygons, find the area of the bunch of polygons, then take the limit over, again, better and better approximations. So this is why we care so much about limits. They are the foundation of both the tangent problem, which is one half of calculus, and the area problem, which is the other half of calculus. Okay. So any questions about what I've done so far? Other than, is that going to be on the test? Well, what else can we do with these uh, kinds of computations? Yes, we can use this process to find areas of curved regions, but we can also use it to find distance traveled. The analogy is that of a rectangle, area is length times width. For distance traveled, distance, uh, rate is distance divided by time. 
right? So distance is rate times time. So if you travel at a constant rate for uh, a certain amount of time, you know how far you've traveled by multiplying those things together. Now, if your rate is not constant, then you can't just take rate times time. What you have to do is break up time into pieces and approximate the rate on each piece with a constant rate. So again, you can do the same thing. And we sort of foreshadowed this last week when we looked at dead reckoning, where you can compute distance traveled based on velocity. Right? I won't tell you the whole story again, but remember that this column here is a, is a measurement of speed, and this column here is a measurement of direction. And from those two informations, you can basically find um, the amount traveled over this interval, the amount traveled over this interval, this interval, this interval, and add them all up. Okay. As an example, let's take a look here. We have a sailing ship cruising back and forth along a channel in a straight line. We have to be a little bit simpler than the real world of sailing because we only have one variable. So our ship is just going to go back and forth like this. Okay. Uh, at noon, the ship's position and velocity are recorded, but shortly thereafter, a storm blows in and position is impossible to measure. So instead, they measure velocity, as they usually do, uh, recorded at 30 minute intervals. So here are the measurements that they took. At 12 noon, they discovered they were going uh, four knots in the easterly direction. At 12.30, they were going eight knots in the easterly direction. At 1 o'clock, they're going uh, 12 knots in the easterly direction. At 1.30, six knots in the easterly direction. At 2 o'clock, four knots in the westerly direction. OK, so they've changed direction. Uh, 2.30, three knots west. 3 o'clock, three knots east. 3.30, five knots east. And 4 o'clock, nine knots east. So the question is, estimate the ship's position at 4 o'clock. Okay. Well, if we just take the uh, speed on the first time interval between noon and 12.30 and say, okay, say, assume that they traveled at four knots for a half an hour, well, how far would he have traveled then? If the ship uh, travels four knots an hour for half an hour, a knot is one nautical mile per hour, two nautical miles. So it would travel two nautical miles over the first interval four nautical miles over the second interval, twelve, uh, six nautical miles over the third interval, three nautical miles over the fourth interval, and now two knots in the other direction, one and a half knots in the other direction, one and a half in the same direction, uh, two and a half in the same direction, and four and a half in the same direction. So if you add this all up, you get four times a half plus eight times a half plus 12 times a half plus six times a half minus four times a half minus three times a half plus three times a half plus five times a half that all adds up to 15 and a half. So we're estimating that the ship is 15 and a half nautical miles east of its original position. OK, so each of these velocities got multiplied by the time interval along which that uh, velocity was traveled uh, to get an estimate of the change in position over each interval. OK, now do you have any comments about that method there? Is it fair to say, or to approximate, the speed between 12 and 12.30 by 4. Is it fair? Why not? OK, yeah, so it, we're, we're uh, shortchanging ourselves by assuming that it travels at 4 all the way up to 12.30 and then jumps up to 8. It's probably increasing continuously, or it's definitely changing continuously between 12 o'clock and 12.30. So another estimate you could make would be to assume that it travels at 8 knots for the entire interval, 12 to 12.30. Or you could split the difference and say maybe it travels something like 6 knots on the interval 12 to 12.30. Well, these are all different kinds of Riemann sums. The one that we're doing here is left-hand endpoints. We could also do right-hand endpoints, or we could average them and we get something called the trapezoidal rule. But in any case, if we had more data, we could get a better estimate no matter what. Right? And if we could somehow have the velocity at every single instant, then we would be able to get the distance traveled exactly by taking the limit over finer and finer divisions of the time. Okay? Well, that's basically the same thing that we did to compute area. Right? You approximate the area under the curve by the area of a bunch of rectangles. 
Here we approximate distance traveled by a bunch of rate times times. Finer and finer divisions get you better and better approximation to area. Finer and finer divisions in time give you better and better approximation to distance traveled. So anything, really, that has a product law in it can uh, withstand this treatment and become a more general fact. So area is uh, length times width. So if you do this Riemann sum for area, you can find areas of curved regions. Volume can be written as area of a base times a height. And so if the area of the base isn't constant, you can do a Riemann sum and take a limit to get volume of curved solids. Anything that has a density, so think about the number of people per square mile measured as a distance from the center of the city. Okay, that's going to you know, thin out the further out you go. And so you can use that density multiplied by area. That will get you the total number of people. And so this Riemann sum limit will tell you the entire number of people in a certain area from the center of the city. Okay, mass is another thing which has density, or weight has density. So you can do, use Riemann sums to get total mass. Anything that's got a speed, distance is, uh, velocity is the speed of distance. But if you have a network, then uh, you know, throughput is the measure of how fast data travels through your network. Or power is the measure of how fast uh, electrons move through an electrical circuit. Anytime you've got that information in terms of time, you can form a Riemann sum and get the total amount. Consumer surplus is a nice area, uh, something you can compute from economics. Basically, it's uh, the amount that the consumer feels they have saved by paying less than they expected to pay. And that you can compute in terms of a Riemann sum. And from probability, the expected value of a random variable can also be computed this way. So this technique of you know, splitting the interval up into finer and finer pieces and taking the limit has all kinds of ramifications in different areas of science. Okay, well, it's time to give that thing a name. Uh, we call this process, this limiting process, the definite integral. OK, so deep breath. Let's uh, define our terms. For the rest of this chapter, we're interested in this property, or this uh, object here. Have some function defined on the closed interval a to b. The definite integral of f from a to b is the number, which is the limit of sums of products of function values times small increments in the uh, x, in the input. Okay. So this is what we were doing uh, with all of the Cavalieri stuff. We were summing up areas of rectangles. Each of those rectangles had a height equal to some function value and had a width equal to some small piece of x. Okay, and in the limit, we got the same thing, whether we took left-hand endpoints or right-hand endpoints or midpoints, et cetera, et cetera. So that limit can be just a property of f between a and b. Okay, so let's uh, deconstruct this bit of uh, symbol on the left. That uh, swoopy s thing is called an integral sign. And yes, it is an s. It's just a very long s. Uh, the thing that's uh, the function inside the integral is called the integrand. Okay, it is a function. The limits of integration are the basically the subscript and the superscript on the swoopy s integral sign. So the one on the bottom is called the lower limit. The one on the top is called the upper limit. And this dx is really sort of a strange thing. But one way to think about it is it's the other part of the integral. An integral has to start with an integral sign and end with a d something. And it indicates what variable you're integrating with respect to. If you have a function of x and you want to integrate it over x, then you put a dx on the right-hand side. If you have a function of y and you want to integrate it over y, then it would be dy instead. Okay, so it's um, basically it's the other half of the integral sign. And yes, it is important. Without that dx, you're really not sure what's being integrated here. Okay, and this process of computing an integral is sometimes called integration. Uh, in computer science, they call it quadrature because they're special, you know, because they, they distinguish integration for something else. Okay. Now, what's supposed to be nice about this is that the sigma is the Greek letter S, okay? and we're summing up a bunch of areas of finite rectangles. They have some height, and they have some width. And we let the width of those rectangles get smaller and smaller. <clears throat> what we get is uh, a German S, uh, where the uh, function values are still plugged in here. 
And now this width is not a finite width, but an infinitesimal width. Okay. I say German because this was Leibniz uh, notation as well. He invented the integral sign and used this dx to mean basically sum of infinite number of rectangles, each of those rectangles infinitely small. Okay, and he was able to wrap his head around that kind of uh, logical gymnastics. Okay, so that's the basic idea. It's a, again, it's a limiting process, just like the derivative. And what we have shown, based on what we computed earlier, is that for any continuous function, even if it has finitely many jump discontinuities, then the integral does exist. And we can compute it any way we like, whether it's left hand, right hand, or midpoint rules. So as an example, let's compute the area between area under the curve from 0 to 3 of the function x. Okay, so we're going to use uh, a Riemann sum here. So for a Riemann sum, we need a delta x. For a delta x, we need an n. So whatever n is, delta x will be 3 over n. Why 3? Because this interval is 3 wide. It goes from 0 to 3. Okay, then for each i between 0 and n, the ith mark in between is just 3 over n times that number i. Okay, we'll use left-hand endpoints. Actually, these are right-hand endpoints here. We'll plug in x c sub i equals x sub i. So the integral will be equal to the limit of the right-hand rule Riemann sums. Right-hand rule Riemann sums can be written as f of x sub i times delta x, sum from i equals 1 to n. The limit of that is n goes to infinity. Now the function is just x. Okay, so f of x of i is x of i, and x of i is 3i over n. So once we get rid of the function, what we have is sum from i equals 1 to n, 3i over n times 3 over n. Okay, the n's here do not figure in the sum. The sum is over i. And the 3's here also do not figure in the sum. So we can pull them all out, and we get 9 over n squared times the sum from i equals 1 to n of i. What's that summation mean? Think about 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 up to some large number n. That's what that is. And there's a formula for that. It's n times n plus 1 over 2. So I want the limit as n goes to infinity of 9 times n, plus n, n times n plus 1 over 2 uh, divided by n squared. Rational function, degree of the numerator is 2, degree of the denominator is 2. So we would hope to have a limit. The coefficient of the numerator, uh, the n squared term in the numerator is 9. The coefficient of the n squared term in the denominator is 2. And so it converges to 9 halves. This stuff goes to 1. And so we get that the area uh, under the graph of the function y equals x between 0 and 3 is 9 halves. Is there another way to do that? There another way to do that. We'll draw the graph of y equals x between 0 and 3, and what kind of shape do you see? You see a triangle, right? So you can compute the area of a triangle the regular way, multiply the base times the height divided by a half. But if it's y equals x, then the base and the height are the same. So the base is 3, the height is 3. 3 times 3 divided by 2 is, again, 9 halves. All right, so at least it confirms what we could figure out already. How about the integral from 0 to 3 of x squared dx? Well, do the same thing. Divide up the interval uh, 0 to 3 into n pieces. So each of them is width 3 over n. And if we were going to mark off 0, 1 through up to n of them, each one is uh, the one at index i is i times 3 over n. Again, we'll do right-hand rule Riemann sums. Again, each of those is written as, whoops, that's a typo. This should be n goes to infinity. Make sure I make that change. f of x sub i is x sub i squared, and each x sub i is 3i over n. So when we get multiply this all out, we have 3 squared times 3, 9 squared 
n squared times n, none of that has anything to do with i, so we can pull it out. And we get 27 over n cubed times the sum of the squares. And that was a formula we'd already looked up before. It's n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. OK. And that's what we want the limit of as n goes to infinity. Well, let's look at the degree of the numerator. It's 3. The degree of the denominator is 3. So we can take the coefficient of n cubed in the numerator, divided by the coefficient of n cubed in the denominator. But what's the coefficient of n cubed in the numerator? We have n times n times 2n. That would be 2n cubed divided by 6n cubed. And so the limit is 27 times 2 divided by 6, or 27 thirds, which is 9. OK. Questions about that one? Go ahead. So the problem is that I should have an n here instead of an x. But we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity. And once you take the limit, then the variable disappears. Right? It's just either it's a finite number or it doesn't exist. But it doesn't depend on n once you take the limit. We fix the number of n, that's the number of rectangles. And we compute the area of the sum of all these n rectangles. So if you tell me n is 100, I've got your area for 100 rectangles. If n is 1,000, I've got the area for 1,000 rectangles. Now what we're going to do is let the number of rectangles get arbitrarily large and wonder what the limit of the areas of all those rectangles is going to be. And once we take the limit, it's not going to have the number of rectangles anymore. We've allowed that number of rectangles to get as large as necessary. So it goes away. Sure, yeah. Just like if the fraction were x squared plus 1 over x cubed plus 1, then the limit of that won't have an x in it. The limit will be a number. In that case, the limit would be 0. Uh, it becomes 27 times 2 divided by 6. Well, with rational functions, remember, you only look at the top degree term. Because as, as n gets bigger and bigger, it's the top degree which sort of dominates the whole thing. So if you were to multiply this all out, it would still be a cubic polynomial. But the first term would be 2n cubed. n times n times 2n is 2n cubed. 2n cubed and a bunch of stuff, uh, right? Nothing, nothing else matters. And when we divide that by 6n cubed, we get basically 1 third plus a bunch of stuff which doesn't matter in the limit. Okay, and then that gets multiplied by 27. All right, good question because this is uh, a lot of notation to swallow on one day. All right, how about for the cubes? Well, okay, what changes? Basically, you make the same construction, but instead of taking uh, the squared here, we're taking the cubes. So again, what we'll factor out is 3 cubed times 3. That's 3 to the fourth, which is 81. n cubed times n. That's n to the fourth. That stuff doesn't depend on i, so we can factor it out of the summation. What's left over is the sum of i cubes from i equals 1 to n. Look up the formula. If you're wondering where all these formulas are, they're in the textbook. Uh, n squared times n plus 1 squared over 4. And here is a polynomial of degree 4 with coefficient 1. Here is a polynomial of degree 4 with coefficient 4. And here's 81. So the limit of this is 1 fourth. And we multiply it by 81. So what we get is the limit, uh, we get the integral from 0 to 3 of x cubed is 81 fourths, which is 20.25. So that's getting pretty repetitive, but you could see it progressing, right? Make the sum, look up the formula, take the limit, bada bing. All right. So let's change gears a little bit and think about how you might. Actually, I I'm going to skip this one and go to properties. Okay. Oops. So 
thinking now in terms of a general f, what kind of things can we say about integrals? Well, here's one very nice fact, is that if you integrate a constant function, what you get is that constant times the width of the interval. Okay, and that seems totally believable because what is the graph of a constant function? It's just a horizontal line. And if you look at the region under the curve, where the curve is a horizontal line, that's otherwise known as a rectangle. And the area of a rectangle, we know that, it's the length times the width. The width is the width of the interval. The length or the height is the constant that is this function. And so that's, you multiply those together, that's what you get. The integral of a sum of two functions is the sum of the integrals of those two functions. Again, this is also eminently believable. It's not obvious, but it comes from the limit laws. Because to compute this integral, we're going to need to take a limit of Riemann sums for the uh, sum of those two functions. But each of the Riemann sums for the sum, f of x plus g of x, is a sum of Riemann sums for f and for g. So if you take the limit of the Riemann sums for f plus g, you get the limit of Riemann sums for f and limit of Riemann sums for g. The limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. So the first of these will be the integral of f, the second of these will be the integral of g. Similarly, if you take your function, multiply it by a constant, and then integrate it, what you get is that constant multiplied by the integral of the function to start with. And it it's, comes from the same reason that we did up here. Basically, take a limit of a function, multiply it by a constant, then the limit will be that constant multiplied by that limit. So you put two and three together, you can say that the limit of a, the integral of a difference of two functions is the difference of the integrals of those two functions. Okay, so this is all great because it means that if we know some basic integrals, we can compute complicated integrals using these linear combinations. And we do, do know a few basic integrals, right? Uh, I just proved all those. Okay. So what if we needed to find the integral from 0 to 3 of x cubed minus 4 and a half x squared plus 5 and a half x plus 1? I think, oh man, do I have to do Riemann sums for that? Well, luckily for us, we've already computed the integral of x cubed between 0 and 3, the integral of x squared between 0 and 3, and the integral of x between 0 and 3. The integral of 1 between 0 and 3, that's a constant function, so the integral is not too hard to compute. So I just piece it on out. I get the integral from 0 to 3 of x cubed dx, minus 4 and a half times the integral from 0 to 3 of x squared dx, plus 5 and a half times the integral from 0 to 3 of x dx, plus the integral from 0 to 3 of 1 dx. Okay, I'll start from back here. This one we did, constant times the width would just be 3 times 1. Uh, 5 and a half times 0 to 3 of x dx, it's 5 and a half times 4 and a half, because I did that one already. This one I also did, 4 and a half times the integral from 0 to 3 of x squared is 9. And then the integral from 0 to 3 of x cubed, I did, that's 20 and 0.25. So all of these numbers that I'm adding up here are numbers I've computed before. When I combine them in this fashion, I get 7 and a half. Okay. The 7, this, uh, seven and a half, we've heard of that before. We were doing all these other integrals, or all these other estimations of the area under this curve. And the equation for this curve is, in fact, this function. So I'm double checking that it is, uh, does have a limit of 7 and a half. OK. So uh, what else can we say about, about properties of integrals? Well, remember this principle that said that if we, take, if we can find the area of, um, if we take some region, cut it up into pieces, find the area of those pieces, that we can add those together to find the area of the piece that we started with. Okay. Now there's a similar rule for integrals. To show you that rule, I'll tell you that we define the integral from b to a to be the opposite of the integral from a to b. Now why would we do such a thing? Well, how would you find the integral from 4 to 3 of a function? How would you find the area under the curve when you're going in the wrong direction? Okay, well, it makes sense, I guess, to call that negative area or to count that area in the negative way. But remember also that you can think of the integral as distance traveled if you're integrating the velocity. So the integral in the backwards direction when the integrand is velocity is kind of like saying, all right, I know where I am at 3 o'clock, 
and I know my velocity function, where was I at 2 o'clock? Just integrate backwards. And the displacement between your 3 o'clock position and your 2 o'clock position is in the opposite direction than if you were going from your 2 o'clock position to your 3 o'clock position. All right, so that's why we make this convention. The other convention is that if we integrate over an interval with zero width, we get zero integral. OK, so if we have these two conventions in force, what we can say is that the integral from a to c is equal to the integral from a to b plus the integral from b to c, uh, no matter what a, b, and c we pick. Best way to show that, I think, is by a picture. The integral from a to b uh, would be this integral area right here. The integral from b to c would be this area right here. And if I put those two areas together, it seems what I have is equal to the area from a to c. All right, so you can break up the interval a to c anywhere you want and sum up the areas on each piece, add them together. On the other hand, if b is larger than c, okay, say it goes a, c, and b, then taking the integral from a to b is this larger area. The integral from b to c is the opposite of the integral from c to b. Okay, so when I add these two together, what I'm doing is taking the larger area and subtracting this big piece. What's left over is the integral from a to c. Okay, so whether b is in between a and c, or b is to the right of c, or b is to the left of a, you can always say that the integral from a to c is the integral from a to b plus the integral from b to c. Okay. So let's say I've got uh, two functions, f and g. And I don't know anything about their equations, but I do know these facts about their integrals. The integral from 0 to 4 of f of x is 4. The integral from 0 to 5 of f of x is 7. The integral from 0 to 5 of g of x is 3. Can I use these facts to find out certain other values of integrals? For instance, can I find the integral from 0 to 5 of twice f of x minus g of x? Can I find the integral from 4 to 5 of f of x? Okay. So just looking at what we learned here about prop this uh, additive property of the integral and the problem about adding functions and multiplying functions, see if you can.